a confirmation hearing for the Joint Chiefs Chairman nominee, and fallout from an Air Force funding shortfall. All of that and more today, July 12th, 2023. Good morning, Early Birds. I'm Jonathan Lairfeld, and this is the Early Bird Brief, produced by Defense News and Military Times. First up, President Joe Biden's nominee to be the next chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff faced the Senate in a confirmation hearing yesterday. I come before you today having served the last three years as a service and Joint Chief. But for the 11 years prior, I served in seven assignments across four combatant commands, UCOM, AFRICOM, CENTCOM, and Indo-PACOM. I vote leadership positions focused on our five national security challenges, China, Russia, North Korea, Iran, and violent extremists. So I arrive before you having spent less time as a drone officer in Washington, D.C., and more time with our field forces, allies, and partners, either in conflict or preparing for conflict. Having led warfighters abroad shapes my thinking. As a result, I'm mindful of the security challenges at this consequential time. During his hearing, Brown laid out the impact that a hold on hundreds of military nominees has on the joint force. Alabama Republican Senator Tommy Tuberville put a hold on senior military confirmations in February over the Defense Department's new abortion policy. The policy gives travel leave for troops to receive abortion services if they're stationed in states where it's no longer legal. But Tuberville was not in the room when Brown outlined the impact his military holds have had. Democratic lawmakers do not want to use limited floor time to confirm otherwise non-controversial military nominees. These nominees are usually confirmed unanimously. Senate Armed Services Committee Chairman Jack Reed said it would take 84 days to confirm all 253 promotions held up on the Senate floor if senators did nothing but vote on them for eight hours a day. Massachusetts Senator Elizabeth Warren chairs the military personnel panel. She said the hold will soon affect approximately 650 military confirmations. That would significantly lengthen the 84-day timeline. Brown has tried to avoid political fights and pledged to set a personal example of remaining nonpartisan if confirmed. But Missouri Senator Eric Schmidt asked a pointed question about Pentagon diversity and inclusion efforts. General, do we have too many white officers in the Air Force? Schmidt brought up a memo that Brown signed onto that updated the Air Force's racial, gender, and ethnicity demographic goals for the pool of officer applicants. That memo called those goals aspirational. The memo also said the Air Education and Training Command and Air Force Academy need to come up with diversity and inclusion outreach plans to achieve those goals. Brown said it was about application goals and not a matter of racial quotas. I think about, uh, for my own career and for many, all of our members, all they want is a fair opportunity to, uh, to perform. And by providing them that fair opportunity, they do not want to be advantaged or disadvantaged or discounted uh, based on their background. Um, they want to have the opportunity, but they got to be qualified. And I'll just tell you from my own career, when, uh, when I came in and, and flying uh, F-16s, uh, I, I didn't want to be the best African-American F-16 pilot. I wanted to be the best F-16 pilot. I would say the same thing uh, when I went to be an instructor at the weapons, go to weapons school, to go back as an instructor, be the commandant. In every position I've had throughout my career, I wanted it because I was the best and qualified. I did not want to be provided a, a position or promotion uh, based on my background. I wanted it be, you know, based on the quality of my work. And I think that's uh, the aspect that all of our service members look for, is they want a fair opportunity, uh, but they also want to be uh, rewarded for the uh, their performance. Another important story, defense officials said this week that the Air Force will delay some permanent change of station moves, selective reenlistment bonuses, and other cash incentives for airmen. Air Force spokeswoman Ann Stefanik said the shortfall is driven by higher-than-projected personnel costs. She also said the Air Force is taking action to avoid running out of funds. Here's why it matters. Anyone who doesn't have authenticated PCS orders in hand by August 1st may reportedly be affected. In any given year, the Air Force may ask Congress for authority to reprogram funds for various reasons when there is a shortfall in one area. According to one source, this year, the request hasn't been approved. That is due to a political fight between the Colorado and Alabama congressional delegations. 
each side is arguing over where U.S. Space Command headquarters will be located. As you may remember, the Air Force announced two years ago that the headquarters would be in Huntsville, Alabama. That choice is still under review. The Space Force has its own appropriations pipeline. That means it is not impacted by the Air Force changes announced this week. As of yesterday, the Air Force is suspending the fiscal 2023 Selective Reenlistment Bonus Program. It will allow airmen who would have been eligible after the deadline to extend their current enlistment into fiscal year 2024. Other programs affected include the Aviation Bonus Program and the Assignment Incentive Pay Program. In other news, the Navy is working on a transformational Iron Man dive suit. For more on this, Navy Times reporter Diana Stancy Carell joins the episode today. Can you tell us a bit more about the suit? I'm guessing it's not like the Iron Man suit from Marvel Comics. So what's it called and what does it do? This new suit is called the Deep Sea Expeditionary with No Decompression, known as the Descend System. So it is a form-fitting atmospheric dive suit composed of rotating and flexible joints to provide divers with greater mobility while also keeping internal pressure steady. When do we expect the suit to be ready and introduced to the fleet? So the suit is still in the early stages, so it's expected to, um, you know, not hit the fleet for several more years. Next steps include becoming designated as a future naval capability sometime from fiscal 2025 to 2027, followed by a three-year development program to craft a prototype suit, suit capable of diving 300 feet. If successful, the suit would then need certification prior to the production of multiple suits. So what's the Navy's need for this capability? What are they thinking of using this for? So the Navy is uh, trying to improve safety and efficiency for projects such as deep ocean salvage of vessels and aircraft, underwater rescues, explosive ordnance disposal, and ship hull maintenance. So that's why it started developing this suit roughly five years ago. So um, when divers are working um, in deep depths, one of the key challenges they face is dealing with pressure in these deep waters, um, followed by decompression sickness, which happens when nitrogen doesn't have enough time to clear from a diver's blood due to a rapid decrease in water pressure. This can be potentially a life-threatening condition, also known as the bends. So to avoid that right now, what divers use is a saturation system System or diving bell pressurized with gas to match the outside water pressure. So the deeper they descend, the greater the danger from increasing water pressure. So right now, divers gradually ascend, stopping at various intervals to prevent nitrogen from forming bubbles in their blood or tissue resulting in decompression sickness. But this new suit, which has now, you know, been in the works for a while, that eliminates the need for this gradual ascent to the surface because it provides one consistent atmospheric pressure. So this allows divers to spend greater time underwater by eliminating the need for a slow ascent. So according to experts, so a job that ordinarily could have taken a mixed gas diver two to three weeks to complete now could take only a day or two in this new suit. Plus, it also eliminates the risk of decompression sickness. Thanks, Diana. For more conversations like that one, please like and follow us wherever you get your podcasts. Also on the radar for today, the House of Representatives is expected to begin voting soon on the Fiscal Year 2024 National Defense Authorization Act. But the White House told lawmakers earlier this week it opposes a provision in the policy bill that would create a special inspector general for Ukraine aid. That provision is modeled after the special inspector general for Afghanistan reconstruction. The House's defense spending bill, advanced by the Appropriations Committee in June, would fund the Ukraine inspector general. The White House statement argued there are already multiple investigations regarding every aspect of assistance for Ukraine. The Pentagon, State Department, and U.S. Agency for International Development Inspectors General have a joint oversight plan for Ukraine aid. But Republicans say a special inspector general can provide an additional, more coordinated layer of oversight. The Ukraine inspector general was one of several provisions that the White House told Congress in a statement it wants to remove. It also objected to several provisions related to the U.S. nuclear arsenal and addressed the Pentagon Cost Assessment Office drawn into a debate over Navy ship procurement. And now, here are some other stories that we're hearing chirps about. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky said the absence of a timetable for his country to join NATO is absurd, as the military alliance meets in Lithuania for a summit. 
alliance leaders did take steps that would speed up Ukraine's path to membership once its war with Russia ends. A Kremlin spokesperson said earlier this week that Russian President Vladimir Putin reportedly hosted mercenary chief Yevgeny Prigozhin at the Kremlin days after the commander led a short-lived rebellion. U.S. Africa Command said the U.S. airstrikes in Somalia have recently killed 10 fighters with the terrorist group Al-Shabaab. And the Washington Post reported the Navy identified the wreck of a World War II aircraft carrier hit by a kamikaze plane. The ship was destroyed by the Japanese near the Philippines in 1945. And on this day in history, in 1957, President Dwight Eisenhower became the first president to ride in a helicopter. He departed the White House in the ride to Camp David. That's it for us this morning. To get more of the top stories and breaking news, go to defensenews.com slash EBB to subscribe to the Early Bird Brief newsletter. Please give us a like, rating, and a comment wherever you get your podcasts. And be sure to follow us on social media at defense underscore news and at military times. The Early Bird Brief is hosted by me, Jonathan Lairfeld, and produced by Zimone Z. Perez. Today's episode features stories by Stephen Losey, Bryant Harris, Karen Jowers, Diana Stancy Carell, and Colin Demarest. Our editor in chief is Mike Roos. Have a great day. Defense.